As engineers, we often just focus on the engineering side of our work, neglecting other important project management skills that are required to have an effective, efficient project. And these are more focused around project finance or scope creep. These are highly important as these are really the things that end up paying the bills. Because it doesn't matter how good your engineering side is, if you can't earn money on a project, you won't be in business for long. Now, don't get me wrong, when you're first starting out, you should definitely focus more on your engineering side than the project finance side, but it's something that you should have in the back of your head. And the more you move through your career, the more important it is. So I'll be going through some of the basics of project finances, how fees are built up, and some aspects of scope that you should look out for. My name's Brennan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. There are two main ways that engineering projects are broken down for fees. It's either a time and expense or a fixed fee. And typically they're also broken down into different stages. So you have stages from design development, tender, construction, all the way through to construction stage services. And in each of these stages, there'll be different amounts of fees allocated to each one of them. And depending on the scope and what it needs to be delivered, this variation will change between each of those. So you normally have like a design development stage, which is where you're going back and forth with the architect, trying to develop their documentation into a more realistic final design. You're working with the client, you're working with other stakeholders. So there's a lot of changes here. So it's not a lot of detailed design, but you're more scoping up and scheming up the building to make sure it's buildable. So during this stage, there will be not necessarily a lot of documentation done, but you will have a lot of iterations, a lot of changes. So it's pretty fast paced. Then after design development, you move into like the tender stage. So a tender stage is there is a lot more numbers behind it. You've made sure that there is all the critical structural areas are being worked out. Detail some of the critical areas that may be the most expensive and put it into a set of documentations that contractors can pick up to help price the project. Then after tender, depending on what's happening, you may have to ask questions of the tenderers. There may be changes that you need to put to the documentation. If the contractor gets involved at this point, this is where you start to develop the construction documentation. So what is finally going to be built? And so whoever being brought into the project to build the building, they'll have some sort of feedback about how they want to build it and it may require your design to be changed. So then you finalize those documents from the tender stage to the construction stage. And obviously then the building is getting built. So then you have your construction stage services. And depending on what the deliverables are, the scope in each one of these will slightly change. Now with the way BIM is going ahead, there's a lot of front-end modeling that you need to do to be able to produce those BIM models. So now the more earlier stages need to have higher fees than what you traditionally used to have. Where back in the day, your peak level of documentation was at that construction stage. So that's typically where you'd get your most amount of money. And of course, construction stage services really varies on what scope they need you to deliver, whether you need to be on site the full time or whether they have someone else to fill that role. To keep this YouTube channel financially viable, don't forget to click the like button. Not only does it help me out, but also allows this to get out to more people. So when you're starting to build up the fees, you need to have all these considerations in how you build up the fees for the projects. So what are the specific deliverables they want on each stage and each milestone? How much work and how much rework may you need to do? So you need to price in things like that for a fixed fee. And you need to really look at the scope. So what is the scope that they've given you that you need to deliver? Sometimes the client doesn't specifically know what they want. So you may need to reverse brief them or change the scope slightly. So you're putting together a fee proposal to deliver the work. So what inclusions do you have and what specific exclusions will they need to consider that you will not do? These all come together to have that final package of what you're going to deliver them and how you're going to help them solve the problem of designing that building. Other considerations when you're trying to price it. So how many drawings do you need to produce? How complex is it? And how much time is it going to take? As really, if you can have a really complex building that may take a long time to design, but the actual documentation at the end isn't that much. So sometimes you need to consider project complexity over the amount of deliverables that you actually need to achieve. Another important one is also knowing what is the overall budget that they're expecting. Now this does change over time, but it gives you some level of idea of how complex of design do you need to put together? Because sometimes if they've got a really low budget, it will mean that you'll need to modify the structure, but also if you're modifying, you're making it more simple and easier to design. So these are other considerations that you need to look for. Yes, over time, you do need to go back and refer back to the design to make sure you're not going too far beyond what the original scope was. But overall, in a fixed fee environment, it's really hard to go back unless they're diverted a long way from the fee. So there's a lot of considerations that you need to have if you're putting in that fixed fee, as they're expecting you to deliver it for the price that you've put down. When you're developing the fee, there's other things that you need to worry about. You need to work out how much each person is going to cost. And this is normally considered something like the burden rate. So what is the burden rate? The burden rate is not actually how much you cost per hour. 
Because when you're looking at how much you cost, there's a lot of additional things you need to add to that. For example, if you've got one colleague, he may go on holidays, so they need to be factored into the fee. He may have sick leave as well, that needs to be considered in the fee. Whatever training he, you may need to pay for him to do. And also you have auxiliary staff, so people that help you to deliver the project, but may not specifically work on the project. So like HR staff, admin staff, people that actually deliver the bids and help you win that work. So depending on the size of your company, that is auxiliary staff can be either grow or shrink. Other considerations that also need to be built into that burden rate is paying for such things as rent or insurances or stationery or any of those other auxiliary costs as well. So they are all built up into a burden rate that you typically can get for your company. So this is how much you cost to be break even. And then they normally put a little bit of profit on that because you need to make sure that everyone's making a profit. Then based on how many hours you estimate are required for that project, you can work out the rough cost estimate that you need to charge to make sure that project is profitable. Now, this is gonna vary between company to company, even countries where you're being delivered or what type of job you need to design. So you need to go to your company and see what the burden rates are to make sure you're pricing your projects effectively. The other way that a project can be delivered is at time and expense. And this is really, as the name suggests, you're more charging at that hourly rate and other expenses that you may endure from delivering that project. The hourly rate in this situation has actually got that burden rate built into it as you still have those all those overhead costs and other expenses that you need to consider to make sure that the project is still viable. Typically, these type of projects are only really for your smaller projects or projects that have ill-defined scope. For example, if they don't specifically know what they're trying to go or what they're trying to aim for, you may have a portion of the project at the start, which is done at an hourly rate, so they can try and develop the design or concepts that they're looking for. It's more exploring what possible ideas they can have in their projects. Even investigations, as sometimes when you've got to deal with existing structures, you don't necessarily know what's going to be underneath if it's very old or poorly documented. So you may need to actually go in there, investigate, find what there is so that you can put up a proper fee in the end so the client doesn't either overpaying or underpaying for the works that you need to do. And as I said, typically an hourly rate is normally on those smaller projects, but sometimes you may lead into a bigger project, which more becomes that fixed fee. And the reason why they move from these hourly rates to these fixed fees is because it de-risks the project, makes it easier for them to finance, and they know specifically how much they're going to pay. Where at hourly rate, it's essentially an open-ended book. So this is why they prefer the fixed fee over these hourly charges. Another really important thing about project finances is focusing on the scope that you're defined to deliver, whether that be on your time and expense or even your fixed fees. So it's basically a list of work that you're included to do or excluded to do in your engagement. And I think that anyone involved with any project should definitely look at the scope of the projects that they're working on. Because a lot of the time you will be asked to do a lot of things that may be just inside or just outside your scope of works. So it's important that you keep a track of that. And when you're starting to move slightly outside your scope, it might be something you will include as it hasn't increased the amount of work greatly, but something that you should bring up with the client because sometimes you can have lots and lots and lots of little changes that can lead up to a big cost at the end. It's like death by a thousand cuts. So having discussions with your client early on that this is currently scoping and at the moment you potentially won't charge them additional for this, but if they start to build up, you may need to start charging them additional for this type of work. When it does come to the point that you do need to charge them, they're not there shocked, oh my God, I didn't realize. You've actually took them along the journey, realized how many changes were actually involved and the fact that you've done all this additional work. And then and you weren't just being greedy at the first time, just going, here, yeah, this is now a variation. So it takes them along that journey and they're more readily to accept that variation at that time. And scope creep is really one of the biggest killers of project finances, as you've potentially tended on a much smaller design scope, but the scope has creeped out meaning you're delivering a lot bigger project for a lower fee. So something you need to consider, it doesn't matter what part of the project you are on. So if you're working on a new project, it's always worth talking to your senior management or whoever's looking after the project finances. So you can have a look at the scope that you're meant to be delivering. So when you're starting to move outside that or within that, it makes it easy for you to make that decision. Should I include this? Should I do this? Or should we go back and talk to the client or the manager to say that we're actually stepping outside the engagement that we're looking at. Another important thing as well, if you step too far out of the scope that you're expected to deliver, you may not be covered by insurances. As insurances have said, well, you've gone well beyond the scope that you're actually meant to deliver and yet you're engaged for, therefore we're not covering you in this situation. So it's not just the project blow it as well. You may actually be violating some of the insurances and limit some of the cover that you may have on that project. If you're interested in supporting the channel, I've got links to my Patreon in the below description. Much like these many members here, 
Without their support, this type of content would not be possible. And as always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week. Bye.